So today, we do come to the end of our series on the Gospel of Luke. And it ends as Jesus' life on earth ended, with the ascension to the Father. So we're going to conclude with just three verses this morning from the Gospel. So this is the last of 22 sermons on the Gospel of Luke, and I tell you we could have done easily twice as many than that, as that. Um, there is so much that is, was not, that we didn't talk about, so many miracles, so many teachings, so many parables, and so I would encourage you to continue to read Luke and to learn from it. There's so much in it. Uh, that we weren't able to get to, and perhaps someday we will revisit it. But for now, we're going to finish up with Luke 24, verses 50 to 52. And it says, When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Importantly, at the end of this gospel, in fact, at the end of every gospel, it is not really an ending. It is, in fact, a beginning. The beginning of Christ as king. The beginning of Christ as high priest. The beginning of the end times, which we talked about last week, which we are in and have been in since Je Jesus' resurrection and ascension. It is the beginning of peace and freedom and hope through a living Savior. All of that from the ascension. There was a popular song in the 1990s by the band Semisonic called Closing Time. I'm sure you've all heard it. And it's really kind of a silly song, but it has this amazing statement in it twice. Every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. And isn't that true? Every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. I like that. The song is definitely not deep, but it's about closing time at a bar. But that one phrase is, is great. And that's what we have in the ascension. The ascension brings to an end Christ's time on earth. The 33 or so years that he spent walking the earth, teaching and, and, and healing people and saying his parables. But even as he rises into heaven... It is truly just the beginning, the beginning of the impact of his time on earth. The ending of his time on earth brought the Holy Spirit into the disciples, now apostles, and brought the Holy Spirit into anyone who claims Jesus as Savior. Just the beginning. It brought the beginning of a new church into the world, one that hadn't existed before. And it's a church that has had immense impact on societies and nations all around the world and is continuing to, despite battles that, that are against the church, the church nevertheless continues to have huge impact in the world. And it brought the beginning of new hope for every person alive through Christ's promise of salvation. A new hope that didn't exist before Christ's ascension. Without the ascension, none of Christ's promises could come true, for he had to remain alive in heaven to fulfill the promises that he made on earth. They all hinged on his ascension to the Father. Renowned 19th century biblical commentator Matthew Henry wrote that only because of his ascension is Christ now able to give believers 
strength equal to their trials and services, that under the influence of the Holy Spirit they may in one way or other be witnesses for Christ on earth, while in heaven Christ manages their concerns with perfect wisdom, truth, and love. Think about that, that as we're going through our days, and if we are following and serving Christ, then he is in heaven Managing our concerns with perfect wisdom, truth, and love. How amazing is that, that he gives us that kind of personal attention. Interestingly, this coming Thursday happens to be Ascension Day. The anniversary of the day that Jesus ascended to heaven. Forty days after Easter. Now, I didn't plan that. It just happen that way. Or, or we could consider it a gift from God that we're having this talk on this day, four days before Ascension Day, the official day that Jesus rose into heaven. The Ascension was so important that Luke actually tells us about it not once, but twice. He tells us about it in the scripture that we just read at the end of his gospel, but then he tells us about it in even more detail in the book of Acts, the second book that he wrote. The first book was about Jesus and all his teachings. His second book was about the beginning of the new church and how the apostles went forward and they created a church out of nothing but their faith and the teachings of Jesus Christ. And so at the beginning of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles is its full name. He writes in, in chapter 1, verses 3 to 11, so right at the very beginning, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to the apostles and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. We talked about that last week. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky <coughs> as he was going, Excuse me. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. A Sabbath day's walk, by the way, is the amount of the distance that people were allowed to walk on the Sabbath, and it was a little over half a mile. And if you walked, you were allowed to walk a little over a mile, but you had to walk one way and then walk back. So you could only go a little over half a mile, otherwise you, you violated the laws of the Sabbath, according to the Pharisees. We know all about Jesus fighting those, those laws, which were not created by God, but by the Pharisees. But anyways, let's take a look at this passage more closely so we can understand it better. Verse 3 tells us that Jesus appeared repeatedly to the apostles after his resurrection. And we know, of course, that he actually appeared to a lot more than the apostles, because it says elsewhere that he appeared to more than 500 people during the 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension. 
But Luke is focusing here on the apostles because he's going to be talking about in this book the history, the creation, and the, and the history of the creation of the church, what happened in those early years of the church. And the apostles were obviously the key characters in the development of the church. So that's his focus. So Jesus and the apostles were eating and, take, and talking, and then they were on the Mount of Olives. Now, it's not clear from, the, the way, from Luke's words here whether they were eating lunch at the Mount of Olives or if they were eating elsewhere. And there's a break in time between two verses. The verse, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In verse 5 and then verse 6, then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So we don't know if there was a break in time or if they were having lunch and just talking at the Mount of Olives. But in any case, we know that in verse 6, they are gathered on the Mount of Olives a little over a half mile from Jerusalem. Now we also see in verse 6 that the apostles are still hung up they are still hung up on this image of the Messiah as being the one, the, the um, rebellious redeemer of Israel who will drive out the Romans and bring self-rule back to Judea. They still haven't quite gotten this yet, even though here we are the day Jesus leaves. And Jesus reminds them, while well, they said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus reminds them again, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set. Now, he's already said this to them before, so he is showing immense patience here that they keep asking him over and over, when are you going to do it? Well, this isn't, you don't know when it's going to happen. Then he quickly changes to a more immediate topic the building of the church. That's why he has called them to him. That's why he called disciples. That's why he named them to be apostles. And he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now this is a reiteration of a statement that he had made which is recorded in Matthew 18, 16 to 20, which is a more famous one. It says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's our mission statement for our church here. And that's, I recited that when Barbara was baptized into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit a few weeks ago. Jesus had said that on a mountain in Galilee to the apostles. And here he's saying it again on a mountain just outside Jerusalem. In fact, the command of going out and spreading the good news is so important that Jesus repeated it a number of times. Some version of it is recorded in every gospel, all four of them. And each time, he is at a different place when he says it. So they're not just telling the same story. They're telling different stories of different times when he said this. For example, in John 20, 21, as the Father sent me, has sent me, I am sending you. He said that as he came into the room in Jerusalem on the very day that he rose from the tomb. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then, in Mark's Gospel, Jesus says it when the apostles are eating a meal, and he says to them, go into all the world and preach the Gospel to all creation. Mark 16, 15. So this is important. Jesus is telling this over and over again. So this is an important command. 
And if so important that Jesus would say it over and over again, then it's something that we have to pay attention to. Isn't it? Now let's finish looking at this morning's passage. The next verse, verse 9, says, After he said this, he was taken up before the very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. What a powerful image that is. I mean, I think sometimes we get so used to reading these passages in the Bible or hearing them that we don't even think about how amazing they are. Just stop and think for a minute. All the apostles have, been, have gone through over 40 days, through 40 days. Well, what they've gone through. First, the tomb was empty. Imagine. Imagine their emotions at that time. You know, we just go over it once a year, and we, you know, sing a great, great songs and, and talk about it. But imagine the feelings if you were there when, you, when they went and looked into that empty tomb, the man they had followed for years was no longer there. And then Jesus suddenly appears alive. He had died on the cross. They had, some of them had watched him. And here he is alive. And even though he had told them this was going to happen, it hadn't sunk in. And they, he stood before them, and they still said, I don't believe it. What did Thomas say? I don't believe it. I don't believe it's you. Well, how, I'm standing in front of you. How can you not believe it's me? Look at the holes in my hands and my feet. Here, give me something to eat. I'll prove to you that I am fully alive. I will eat food. And now, they're standing here on the Mount of Olives, and he suddenly begins to rise up into the sky. No ropes, no pulleys. Just rising into the clouds, floating up. I would have just there with my mouth hanging open. And I suspect that they were. In fact, it says they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. I'm sure they were. And then something else amazing happens. The second half of the verse says, suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Now they had been out on the Mount of Olives. This is out in a, a place that is remote, away from the city. There's no streets going by that someone could come out of the, out of the alley or from the next street. And they're there, just the bunch of them. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's two men dressed in white right beside them. Who were these men? And where did they come from? Well, we know who they are. They're angels. And they came to give them a message. And that message is, men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. He floated up. He will float. Come back out of the heavens. The apostles responded by doing just what they were told. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. These are the same brothers we talked about a couple of weeks ago who went early in his ministry to take him home with Mary. The same brothers, he said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? You who believe in me are my mother and my brothers. And now they're together, they're praying. They've accepted him. They know that he is the true and faithful savior. So what does all of this mean for us today? Well, the ascension means a great deal. It means, one thing, that Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, 
And he has the ear of the Father whenever the topic of our disobedience comes up. And you know that our disobedience comes up a lot because we are not the most obedient bunch, are we? The Father sees and knows all, but the Bible tells us that Jesus is our intercessor. And so he speaks for us. He seeks forgiveness for us, our sins. The Father is a judge, and he must have things pure, and we are not. But Jesus, just as he did in the end of John when he gave that long prayer right before his death, that long prayer saying, God, forgive them, for I, you and I are one, and they and I are one, and so they and you are one. And what a wonderful thing that is. So he speaks for us. He seeks forgiveness for us. And the Bible tells us he is our intercessor. He ensures our righteousness, the verdict of righteousness, when we stand before the judge. The ascension also means that we too can ascend to our heavenly father because Jesus did we can too. He showed us, he proved it, it can happen. Because Jesus did, so shall we, if we have faith and trust in the one who is the way and the truth and the life, then we too shall ascend. He has opened the door to heaven for us. He had the key, and he opened it. And he invites us to go through it. His ascension gives us a joyful promise and opportunity for eternal life in glory. But we have to say yes. If we say no, we're not going. We have to say yes to Jesus. All of these wonderful things and more came from the ascension, but something else came from the ascension, and this is the one that people don't like. The ascension gave us great responsibility. We are to share in the apostles' work of transforming the world by bringing the good news and the love of Jesus to all people. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3.9 that God does not want anyone to perish, but wants everyone to come to repentance. I think that's a wonderful that our God wants everyone to be saved. And because he does, so should we, right? Not just our family members. Hey, I want you in heaven with me. We say to our son or grandchildren or our spouse. But everyone in this whole world, for that to happen, we got to help. We can't be sitting on our duff saying, let the missionaries do it. We have to share Jesus Christ and the good news of him. C.S. Lewis wrote, The church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. The church has to evangelize. And guess who the church is? All of you. You are the church. The Christian church is under attack today, both here in America and in most other nations around the world. And many church leaders are talking about the need for a revival of our faith. I've mentioned it on a few occasions. I hear it all the time. I read about it in emails. I get tons of emails from different Christian organizations and talking about revival. It's time for a revival. And Christians are praying for that, praying for a revival. It's been years since there was a true revival 
actually a century, over a century, since it was a true revival, it will take an act of God for that to happen. But it's also going to take a lot of smaller acts by all of us for that to happen. We can't just sit on our duffs and wait for God to do it. If we don't share the message of Jesus, if we don't tell people what we have found in our faith in Jesus Christ, the joy, the power, the healing, the sense of love, the comfort, the peace in our lives, if we don't tell people about that, what there is for them if they come, then we're not doing our part in God's plan. And that's not a good place to be. God has a plan. And the plan includes every one of us. Every one of us. And it is to make all come to Jesus, not force them, but to cause all to come to Jesus and to his love. Jesus said it over and over again. As Christians, can we, should we, do anything less than obey Jesus' commands? Well, his very last command was to go. Spread the word. Take it to others. Other communities. Other households. Other countries. Other nations. Share the good news. Tell people about the joy he gives us and the promises, promises he made, about the eternal future that he offers to us. It is time for a revival. It's been far too long since there was a true revival. And I pray it happens. I do, I pray it happens. But for it to happen, we all have to get to work. We all have to do our part. We can't just sit on our laurels and say oh, we're good Christians because we come to church and we pray every day. We have to talk. We must get on board and share Jesus. So I challenge you today, are you on board for sharing Jesus? Will you do your part? Because Jesus has asked you to do that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know your desire. Jesus made it very, very clear. He said it again and again. Your desire that we talk about you, that we talk about what's happened in our lives because of you. We all have stories. We all have had experiences of miracles. And yet we sit quietly so often and we don't tell people about them. We're afraid to. We're afraid that we'll be rejected. We're afraid that they'll think we're crazy. We're afraid that we won't be part of the gang or, um, or we're just too timid. But Lord, we know. We know you have asked us to do this in our relationships with people. And so we pray that you will give us the strength to do it the courage to do it, the boldness to do it, the way to do it, and the words to do it. May it all come from you, and may it come through us to them, so that we might grow this church just as you have commanded. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We praise you for all you do and all you are. And we pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.